Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome once again to the CEC Edisert live lecture. Dear friends, in this uh, session today we are going to talk on Sir Harford Mackinder's legacy to geopolitics and for this we have again with us in our studios Dr. Amrish Dhaka. He is an associate professor in School of International Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University. So taking advantage from his experiences, let's understand about this topic. Hello sir, welcome, welcome to the Edisert lecture. Uh, I hope that all the students who might be watching us right now would be benefited from this particular lecture so over to you sir thank you Kitika. hello good afternoon gentlemen uh, we today would like to discuss on a very interesting and important topic within the domains of uh, geography and specifically the specialization of geopolitics which draws in a lot from many other parent disciplines of political science sociology anthropology and even the strategic studies and international relations per se. The idea about this gentleman is that this he has written a paper in 1904 which was a very famous paper known as the geographical pivot of history and that pivot has been constantly discussed over a century has gone now and the, the observations made by this gentleman and the prognostic value that paper carried somewhere uh, it still has its resonance even after the uh, various axiomatic statements have been made about the international situation such as the Fukuyama's claim of end of history and the new international order which uh, almost uh, uh, minimized the possibility of any conflict scenario that emerged in the aftermath of the Cold War. However, the present situation in Ukraine and also the Caucasus where the destabilization is there, we find that there is again a kind of a phoenix kind of rise of, of this paper's assertions and we find that Sir, Harf Sir Halford Mackinder's claims though he has been at numerous times uh, eulogized and at, its, at the same time criticized, the sustainable value that this paper carries is of uh, prime importance and today would like to shed some light on it and how it uh, is uh, relevant today in the context scenario as well. The term we know geopolitics has uh, come into the uh, vogue since the early 19th century and we find that the uh, Swedish political scientist Rudolf Jelen in 1899 coined this term geopolitics and later on this term was espoused by the uh, Riestag government and in, the, in their proponents uh, in Germany who wanted more territorial gains for the country and this notion of Lebensraum that means the living space was very pivotal for them and somewhere geopolitics uh, drew, drew a negative connotation owing to that kind of espousal of the cause. However, the, the term itself never uh, claimed to have that kind of grandiose uh, objectives and territorial ob objectives were only seen in terms of the great scheme of the world rather than any nation state's uh, sense of aggrandizement. So we find that this geopolitics has also been uh, defined by the critical geographers such as Gerard Tuathil in his uh, geopolitics reader. He says that geopolitics provides an insight into the historical struggles over the organization of the global political space. Now the, the, the idea about this global political space is, is a perspectival notion about how the great powers have been uh, designing and uh, how they have worshipped uh, this uh, notion of organizing the space according to their interest. But beyond that, there is always a kind of a salute of possibility where one can see that it is not only that the global powers have always wished, but the, the, the nature of systems that has emerged over the, over the conflicting tendencies and the forces of production they themselves have the immediate potential that can also contribute to this organization of the world space. And that is why the post Cold War world geopolitics has come to be described as the civilizational clashes or global warming, social movement struggles, the global finance and its impact, the translational communication networks as well as the global environmental degradations. So the, all these have where there is a kind of a push and pull uh, in, into the what you call the global visualization of the space geopolitics has derived and acquired multifarious dimensions to its definition and its nuances. We find that the Cold War geopolitics uh, is about the control of the state spaces between the two rival su superpowers, but the modern geopolitics is more about the borders and the territoriality 
uh, in, 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 the, in the way where the states have uh, weakened and the globalization and the forces of globalization have actually uh, liquidated or may you can say that territories have be become more perfor perforated so far as the international influences are con concerned. So the geopolitics can also be seen as a visualization of the local and the regional competing scenario into the one grand perspective of the world political map. Uh, which has also uh, term has been coined as the globalization, that means globalized localization. So the, the another important uh, qualifier of this term of geopolitics is that the timeless perspective, that is the time space compression. We find that the, the true value of any geopolitical prognostics are lying in the fact that they are across the time space holding some degree of universality. So we find that the territory of the states is transcended by the terrorism, separatism, and ex extremism. These notions actually cross both the pre-Cold War or in the Cold War and the post-Cold War scenario where the, uh, the crisis of the state and, and, and their, their survival has been plagued by these three important forces. Then the geopolitics is also seen as the end of the space means there, there is a kind of a timelessness across the distance and there, there, is, a, there is no perspective of distance decay, just as uh, claimed by the, the, the famous uh, scholars in, 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 in the domain of what you call the information technology, that the earth has been almost become flat and, and you, you do not find any, any kind of a time loss over the great distances that is information, material, goods, they are actually traveling. So th this is another important characteristic feature which, where the geopolitics has uh, factored into the new, new found uh, forces which are shaping the earth order. Then the, an, another important fact is that the, the, the geopolitics is also uh, uh, represents a kind of a hiatus, the break from the past where the era of global discoveries came to an end and by almost 20th century the whole earth surface was discovered. No new square inch of land was to be discovered and we find that this this practically kind of a closed environment in which the space was now near complete and the limitations were there. The only, only uh, change of territories or only, only new acquiring of the territories could be possible by a, a zero sum game where, where the one state would like to uh, gain more territories at the loss of the another state's territory. So this, this also represents a kind of a uh, geop the notion of geopolitics, the hiatus that has uh, come to this stage. Now this, this is also one of the important aspect of the geopolitics that the, the near containment of this scenario where the land can only be acquired at the cost of the another state, the communities and the relationship of the, among the communities has also become an important factor in the state behavior. So how the states have re responded to each other and in the international scenario, scenario where it is largely claimed that there is a kind of a prevalent anarchical order. The, the, the colonized and the, and the communities which have emerged and which have actually resisted the, the, the imperial orders, it shows that the geopolitics has something to do with the reorganization of the space so far as the imperial order and the colonized communities are concerned. We find that this knowledge and power, they become the two important elements of the discourse in geopolitics. We find that the critical geographers have actually seen geopolitics as a kind of a discourse which was created by the imperial powers only to convey their means of power and their desire to reorganize the space into their own interests. That is how the geopolitical understanding was propagated from the one corner of the earth to another. But is it the case that that has been only the single uh, faceted argument about the geopolitics? It is also said that the knowledge also gets restructured by the forces which are across the time and space. Uh, prevalent and, and, the, and, the, and the, one of the important contentions which McCandle's paper very exactly makes that there are historical processes which are going beyond the time and space in such a manner that they have their impact on, on not only on the current scenario but also the future development of the scenario. And this ontological approach and ontological understanding of McCandle somewhere crisscrosses the argument of the critical geographers who actually believe that this is actually an imperial discourse being created by the uh, the, the, the statesmen who actually are in service of the great powers. The, the important lessons that Mackinder's paper gives us can be summarized as follows. Number one is that Mackinder has actually looked through his paper of 1904 
that there is a human history as a part of life of the world organism. So, he sees that the, the, the various parts of the earth uh, ranging from not only the seven continent and the seven seas, but also within those continents there have been units which can be seen organi organismically in that nature and they have responded to each other whenever there is a kind of a shift and adjustment has taken place. Then the social reverberation is the bound to break and break and weak, weaken the political and economic links in the network laden world. He says that the, the, the process through which the whole impact is conveyed from one part of the other world is actually a pre-existing notion and, and, and the, the world has actually been a networked and a unified whole. Unlike the claims made by the, the geographers of the, of, the, of the 19th and 18th century when the new world's discoveries were being made. So, the, the, the main contention and the main reference was made actually to the European Asian world and African world also especially the northern part of the African continent. So, these units have been historically seen by Mackinder as a great unit where the there have been linkages of the long standing and though various phases of changes have emerged in the parts of the world such as industrialization in the Europe or the agriculture the way it has developed in the Asiatic lands, but they have responded over the period of time to the various changes that have happened in the region. So, this was one of the important uh, you can say the, the satirist peribus assumptions which he has laid down before outlining this paper. The ideas that worked through civilization and gave birth to nations were not ontological processes alone and the phylogeny expressed through the physical controls also plays a role in the birth of these nations. So, he is actually referring to the West Phylian order. It was not something what you call the unique conditions of the internal society, the, the kind of a economic stages that were arrived by the communities that led to the birth of the nations, but he says that there were a quite sufficient number of exogenous and the extraneous factors that also pushed the uh, communities to forge themselves into a nation and organize their social and political spaces into a statehood. So, it is not only the sing single handed political economy of the state uh, of the society that has uh, quite uh, a emerging out of its own internal forces, but there has been a larger global geopolitical processes which have actually tinkered with the emergence of the nations, especially the West Phylian order which he points out in the European space. So, Mackinder says that European civilization is in a very real sense the outcome of the secular struggle against the Asiatic invasion. He refers this to a very grand scheme of process in which the various Mongol hordes and the Hunnic hordes who descended in the 6th and the 5th century to the European spaces and they hammered around all the you can say the periphery of the Europe and Asia and conditioned the various spaces that forced the European civilization especially to take a real look about their organization of the society. And he says that location of Europe was particularly unique because at the once juncture Europe faced towards the east the vast, the vast steppe lands and on the western coast there was the Atlantic Ocean. So, the location of the European communities between these two vast spaces, one oceanic frontage and another was the continental frontage. There the influence of the Hunnic hordes and the Mongol hordes conditioned them, say, these communities into such a manner that they had no choice but to organize themselves into strong nations, so that they can also uh, develop their economic frontage towards this, toward this oceans and which led to further creation of what you call the navigation and maritime conquering of the political world or you can say the political politicization of the oceans and the seas. So, uh, the important aspect which Mackinder actually bring this, brings in his paper is that the, there is a vast geocultural process that ha has been taking place and this geocultural process has been quite important to delineate that though we can see certain process within the quick short span of time and space, but there they may be what you can see that they may be conveyed through the larger order geopolitical process which have occurred in the history. So, he says that the one and the continuous ocean enveloping the divided and insular lands is of the of course, the geographical condition of ultimate unity in the command of the sea. So, he says that since the all the seven oceans are linked together the whosoever commands and the masters the sea, he definitely has access to all the seven seas and his power would grow enormously because he is able to touch upon all the peripheries of the, the great European Asian continent and through this 
he is able to command resources better. The broad political effect was to reverse the relations of Europe and Asia for the whereas in the Middle Ages, Europe was caged between an impassable desert to the south and an unknown ocean to the west and icy and forested west to the north and the northeast and in the east and southeast was constantly threatened by the superior mobility of the horsemen and the camelmen. So we find that Mackinder postulates that due to this uh, movement of uh, hordes from the steppes towards Europe and the constant hammering of the, the communities, they were forced to make a choice between survival and extinction by developing their economic strengths to command the seas. And that is why the Europe and Europe's uh, uh, strengthening and commanding over the oceans was one of the direct impact of the great Hunnic and the Mongol hordes. So Europe which emerged upon the world multiplying more than 30 fold the sea surface and the coastal lands to which she had access and wrapping her influence around the Euro-Asiatic land power which had hitherto threatened her. So ultimately the result was that the Europeans were able to circumnavigate the whole this Europe-Asiatic land power and they were on the periphery touching upon all the coastal areas and they were able to access in make inroads to vast lands with the new resources and the discovery of the lands was also somewhere attributed to the consequence of the Asiatic hammering done by the Hunnics and the Mughal hordes. So we find that uh, the, the, the geographical pivot of history, the paper which Har Sir Harford Mackinder wrote has actually this one big cornerstone or it, it is a kind of a, uh, a, a giant proposition which he says that there, is a, there has been a kind of a globalization of an ancient kind, maybe not the very, very uh, holy, holier of the kinds, but the, the fact remains that the human civilization has been interlinked since times ancient and we find that the processes are still having their reverberations so far as the modern development of the linkages and the geopolitical relations among the states are concerned. So he says, he further says that new Europe's were created in the vacant lands discovered in the midst of the waters and what Britain and Scandinavia were to Europe in the earlier times that have America and Australia and to some measure even Trans-Saharan Africa and now become to the Europe Asia. So he actually further looks into the vast scheme where he says that the island location of the Britain and its relation with the European mainland, the continent and the island relation which the, with the Europe held for centuries, the similar fashion uh, in a similar fashion that relation has emerged between the North America and the giant European Asian continent all order. So he says that once that reaction and once that, that proposition of, uh, the, of, of relationship between the Asian and the Eurasian communities and tribes and the European tribes is accepted, then the same can be generalized for the larger world order in which the American communities and the American state and the American nation can look into what or we can say the relationship which has developed between the North America and the Eurasia, this, this can be modeled on the same relationship the way it was between Britain as an island and the European mainland. This draws us a long lessons into the history and it, it forces us to peek into the what has happened in the European history so far. I will try to uh, draw in certain salient features which help us in understanding the scheme of this paper. But Mackinder had actually uh, created a kind of a, a, a vista in which, in which there is a large process which is, he has developed and he believes that the, the present scenario holds that process in eternity. So this question, the, the proposition of eternity has been questioned by many scholars and the critical geographers have uh, uh, likened this to a permanency of geopolitical interests of the great powers. But one should also acknowledge the fact that the focus of the imperial powers has shifted from in, 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 in the neo-imperial discourse or the, or, or the sense of the neo-imperial discourse that the European powers no, no longer command that kind of strength and it is now the Americans and the America remaining as a new superpower that that geographical shift has been there. So if th that geographical shift is acknowledged then there is always a valid reason to understand that that Mackinder's model can be extended to the larger world order as well. Now he also looks into what you call the geographical uh, forces and phenomenon operating at several scales. So at one point he, he would like to look into what you call the, the notion of maritimity and continental relations between the powers and the, their scale of operation within the, within the Europe as well and beyond that how it has happened into the world at large. So he says that European civilization is in a very real sense the outcome of the secular struggle against the Asiatic invasion. The most striking coincidence of the history 
was the seaward and the landward expansion of the Europe. The only history which counts is that of Mediterranean and the European races, the ancient opposition between Roman and the Greek, the failure of the Rome to Latinize the Greek and the Teuton was the civilized and Christianized by the Roman, the Slav in the main by the Greek. He wants to draw a very, very unique uh, kind of a observation from what you call the major developments in the European history. He says that the, there has been a historic divide between the Roman culture and the Greek culture. And this division somewhere further funneled into the what you call the divide in terms of religio-political divide as well, where the Roman strictly adhered to the Catholic Church and the Greeks were more into the orthodox uh, uh, fold of the Christianity. So he says that this divide further went into the what you call the religio-political uh, organization of the European space in which the areas of the Germany, France and Britain were more Latinized and, 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 and in fact the, 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 uh, the organization of the space he calls the Romano Teuton, the Teuton refers to the Germanic and the, and the Holland uh, Dutch races. So the, the, the relationship of the Dutch races with the, the Roman Catholic Church was particular and in the similar fashion the Slavs had a quite affinity with the Greek Orthodox Church. So this organization of the space is a very important uh, observation he, which he makes not only on the basis of geography but also the preferences of the religion and the relig political religious organization of the European space. Now this has certain connotations when we look into the larger global uh, organization of the space which he see, speaks of in terms of the impact of the religion and Christianity over the Eurasian space and its further global or order. He says that the autonomies of the material and non-material culture is always there. He says that there is, a, there is a difference in terms of maritime impact of culture and there is also a difference in terms of the land or you can say continental impact of culture. So far as the continental impact of culture is concerned, there is always a neighborhood effect. And he says that there is a non-material culture is, when it is of particular concern then the organization of the space into the hierarchical order is also one of the important aspects so far as the continental organization of the culture is concerned. So he's, he's, uh, he observed that Romans could never Latinize the Greeks, but the Slavs were under the influence of the Greeks just as Teutons were immunized. Then the conditions of material innovation are also dependent on the spatial opportunities and constraints as evident in the landward and the seaward advance of the European powers with totally different set of material progress and tools. So this is also an important aspect because we find that the maritime powers who were actually looking for the new routes towards uh, uh, Asian lands, they were able to explore Africa and vast resources and the new kind of uh, connections were developed by them. So this, this is was one of the also very important aspect which he uh, tried to brought out. And the sail ships to horses, to steamships, to railways, the Eurasian space has been testimony to alternating influences of mobility and the empires. The, the, the one of the important cornerstones of the organization of the space has been the transportation networks and the communication. And he says that there is a kind of a pattern which has emerged, whereas in the earlier days, the sail ships were able to somewhere navigate through Mediterranean and the Red Sea, there was a dominance of the maritime commerce. But suddenly with the occurrence of the horses and later on in the, in the era of where the steam engine and the railways uh, turned the tide in the favor of the continental organization of the space that is the land powers. And he says that whole Europe and Asia can be organized across length and breadth thousands of kilometers where railways can transport goods and the people from one point to another without much difficulty. And this had a, an also a strategic significance so far as the, uh, the, the empires and their interests are concerned. So we find that the, the technology also becomes one of the important geo, uh, geopolitical factors where the, the organization of the empire and their efficacies are concerned. So railways and the ships bring brought the essential difference to the organization of the, of the power in which the material conditions of mobility were also important and the new lands were explored and they also become the points of convergence. So the important, important aspect of, uh, of this paper is also that the, 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 the period in which Mackinder wrote this paper also were seeing the giant changes in terms of transportation and communication. And the same kind of uh, transition can also be analogized or, or the analogy can be drawn in, in the sense of 
uh, what is happening in terms of the global integration in terms of information technology. So, the vast spaces that are being now uh, the, the organized or being organized and the economies that are being re realized though the, they, they do not especially cannot connote any, any spatial relationship, but the fact remains that there are very important aspects which uh, Marikander has hinted in terms of connectivity and the networks so far as the uh, geopolitical power is concerned. So, the pivot he defines in 1905 is of great importance. The Mackinder defined the pivot as the vast expanses that led between Russia and the Russian Empire and Mongolia and the production potential of the region being enormous with the plenty of minerals and vast cultivable rich lands and so forth. And the railways became being an important factor for the military and or economic organization of the space as well. So, we find that this pivot, this, this geographical pivot which he on the map refers to as a kind of a, uh, a, 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 a space which is not only in terms of vastness, but also it bears enormous wealth in terms of minerals, non-minerals and in fact, if, if you want to uh, bring in the current factoring of the forces, then Central Asia and the Eurasian space are also repository to huge energy resources and energy geopolitics is also very important on that account. But at that point, that assessment was unavailable to Mackander, but he on the purely on, on the spatial terms, he brought out that this pivot has a huge quality in terms of resources material and their connectivity and this uh, vast space now is being commanded by Russia. So, he actually prognosticated the giant possibilities for the growth of the Russian empire. Uh, at that time, there was no uh, communist power, it was only the Russian Tsardom in 1904 and, and it was only that after a decade or so that the, this Tsardom had vanished, but the fact remained that Mackinder's assessment somewhere had a huge value for even the successive regime change and the kind of a new political and social system that emerged in the form of the USSR. So, the geopolitical order he, he dis defines at that time was of this kind in which not only the pivot, but uh, beyond the pivot he tried to define two strings and two important strings were the inner or the marginal crescent and there was an outer crescent. So, the great inner crescent which was defined by Mackinder contained the countries of Germany, Austria, Turkey, India and China and in the outer crescent he actually put Britain, South Africa, Australia, United States, Canada and Japan. Sparingly Japan and Britain which were actually were the island countries of, of the uh, most ancient standing. All these new lands of South Africa, Australia, United States and Canada were the were actually the, the, the new addition to the European Asian order of the uh, this pivotal state. So, Russia was an important central state holding this pivot and beyond that there was an inner and marginal crescent and outside was, uh, was there was an outer crescent. And this organization of the world order somewhere, uh, Mackinder said that it had had its long standing even before the advent of the industrial revolution. And it only only new addition after the industrial revolution has been this outer crescent and prior to that this pivotal state and the inner crescent had their contention of power and the balance of power essentially laid between these two rings. He also mentions a bit about India's role and, and, and even the, the position of India essentially laid in the inner and the marginal crescent. He said that the countries like France, Italy, Egypt and India and Korea would actually become many bridgeheads where there would be a kind of a contest as well as there may be a possibility of balance emerging where the maritime forces would like to look into controlling these countries and they would somewhere make the balance against the giant strengths and the capabilities of the pivotal state. So, France and India somewhere uh, brought that kind of a balance of power and British occupying the Indian state uh, or the Indian space at that point of time somewhere uh, confirmed what you call the notion or the or, or the aspect which actually has drawn the criticism from the critical geographers that India was uh, seen as a kind of a bridgehead to balance this giant uh, pivotal state and that is why the colonization of India was justified in terms of the uh, British imperial interest. However, the, the Mackinders nowhere actually ex exclusively made claims for Indian colonies so far as the British interests are concerned and his pivotal theory was largely confined to defining the larger European crisis and the emergence of 
out of that European crisis, the great political order to which India certainly was a party at, at in certain stages. So, while concluding his paper, he also brings it some what you call the possible innovations and developments that have happened. And one of the important development was ba based on the what you call the exposure of the new lands to this pivotal model, largely lying in the outer crescent. And he said that the vast potentialities of South America, because South America equally held vast natural and mineral resources that can strongly leverage the power potentialities of United States and just it would be the same phenomenon the way England had access to African and the Asian colonies that the United States may at some time become a great maritime power due to this South American resources. And if the power such as Germany which is essentially a Euro central European power would like to access then, uh, then, we, then he brings out that one of the reasons why United States is strictly adhere to the Monroe doctrine in which any access to the Latin American countries by the European powers would seen as a kind of a detrimental to the European interest or to the, uh, to the United States uh, interest and it would intervene in, in the situation. So, we find that this pivotal state and its extension uh, given by Mackinder somewhere has this uh, permanency of interest given uh, the, the relationship between the maritime and the continental interest built around the model of the European Asian organization of the space. And we also find that the last very important mo modification which he did was that if this ever a Russian pivotal state were to collapse and if there is a some kind of a movement from the eastward, the, from the eastern side that is the Japanese or the Chinese, they were to occupy this pivotal space, then he declared it a kind of a yellow peril means that uh, the vast spaces uh, would again be commanded by the power and the, the kind of a manpower that China has then there, this will be a huge uh, state with the, again the, knowing the fact that Chinese are very good in organizing the uh, state and they have a huge tradition of bureaucracy that the Europe, Eurasian order may actually further extend beyond the European Asian order and the African continents like Africa and America may be under strong influence. But here he also made one uh, cautionary note was that it is now imperative for the Europe to align with the American forces in order to counterbalance this, uh, this newly, uh, this new possibilities. That means that the outer crescent and the inner crescent at some point of time would congelate into a giant polarized space against this pivotal state. So, if you see the map, this is what the arrangement that was done, given by Mackinder and in which you see in the map, uh, in, in the screen that there is a central position which was given by the Mackinder to the Russian space, it was a pivot area. From the northern side, it was covered due to the Arctic Ocean and the, the frozen seas. So, it was, it was, it, it cannot be attacked from the northern side, but he believed that the inner crescent and the, and the outer crescent, they had almost all around the periphery the access to the pivotal area and similarly pivot area can also approach through now modern railway navigations, the, the central, uh, the, the, all the peripheral points of contact. So, the balance of power somewhere was lying along the periphery and if you know that the, this on the western side, the eastern European space and on the southern side, the South Asian subcontinent and on the eastern side, you find the Korean Peninsula, they have been the hot spots during the uh, post uh, World War II scenario and in the Cold War period. So, uh, once he gave this lecture, usually these lectures, these erudite lectures were given by the, uh, the statesman like Mackinder in the Royal Geographical Society and this lecture definitely was one of the one which was appreciated and there was a comments uh, given by the scholars there and the, the people like Wilkinson, Holditch, Amri, they have a huge connection with the British Empire in India and they have been the policy shapers to the British policy in India. So, it is important to see what comments they were uh, giving, uh, given at the point of paper presentation by Mackinder. And uh, I would like to only bring few salient features uh, of those points. One was that the, his paper was uh, seen as one of the, uh, you can say the, uh, a very closed system and there was no scope of any, any kind of a turbidity or entropy uh, so far as the political uh, ordering of the space is concerned. So, Spencer Wilkinson said that on the Eurasian periphery, there has been largely a fragmented zone. So, there will always be possibility to tilt in the balance in the favor of the 
uh, outer crescent or the maritime powers and the great state or the pivotal state would not be able to have that kind of influence. Then the Sir Thomas Holditch who was uh, also uh, believing that the Mongols though they had an influence towards the western sphere, they certainly were not able to venture into the uh, Indian subcontinent the way Scythians and the Aryans. So, how it is possible that the, if the Russia becomes a strong pivotal state, will it be possible that it will command all the peripheries with the equal strength? So, that was one of the important observations. Then Lord Amre, he also said that the dichotomy of the land versus sea power is too simplistic to assume and uh, we also know that the the economic inventions, uh, the economic uh, developments and the scientific inventions, they are actually uh, one of the important stages that are arrived by the societies and from the agrarian societies to the, to the uh, coastal maritime seafaring societies to the industrial societies, all these have been the clear mark stages and it will not be possible to have what you call some unified scheme of organizing the space where all the three systems would have the same level of uh, technological development and the same set of geopolitical interest. And they finally, Mr. Hogarth, he also commented that the it is not always the singular movement from center to periphery, but also the centripetal movement from the periphery to center has always been there. And we find the influence like Buddhism and Islam, which go, which have gone from the peripheral Europe, Asia to the central uh, lands of the of the this heartland. So why there is a uh, so much of you can say anguish or 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 so much. A, uh, priority that has been given to the pivotal state. So, uh, after these, these kind of criticism, Mackinder certainly did not leave his hypothesis. In fact, he came up with uh, in 1919, uh, in 1919, one of the uh, revised versions in the form of extended discourse as a book and the book was uh, titled as Democratic Ideals and Reality. This was very important book because uh, the whole discourse of post 904 has been uh, uh, harboring on, on one of the important axioms of Mackinder, which ha he had developed in the aftermath of this uh, uh, revision. And I would like to draw some of the important uh, uh, assumptions which Mackinder actually improved and Mackinder defined to his heartland model in this subsequent book. He, what, he important, what he wanted to uh, uh, postulate was that, that this heartland order is not something about threatening the world peace. But he said that this dichotomy of continental forces versus maritime forces has its Im implication in understanding the state of democracy and the global ordering. And he said that democracy refuses to think strategically unless and until it is compelled to do so for the purpose of defense. And he said that largely the forces of outer core crescent and those forces who are lying in the internal or the marginal crescent are the forces of democracy, whereas the pivotal and the central state has largely been authoritarian as the history goes. And the reason for authoritarianism has been the vast organizing of the space that has been easily done through the marching of the horses. And, the, uh, and in the same fashion, he says that the, the Russians and the Slavs uh, have been able to organize through the Cossacks or the, the, the space eastward. So, the, the importance of, of the centrality and, and, its, and its political qualification of this geopolitical uh, geographical centrality with the choices of the political order were one of the important uh, assumptions that Halford Mackinder made in order to improvise and uh, revise this paper. And he said that Germany's role in, on a smaller scale uh, lies with the same manner the way the, the, on the larger scale the role of Russia lies with relation to the European Asian order. So, within the European order, he says that Germany's centrality and the, and the way the authoritarian order which Germany has been particularly inclined for in, in, in the uh, 19th century emanates from this geographical centrality of Germany and, and being a middle European power that is the, the central power, it has necessity to command the strengths to on, on all the sides of periphery to project its interest. So, the, the, the new concept or the new geographical visualization which, Mac, the, uh, which Mackinder did was that he extended the idea of heartland to the world island and this world island was now integrating uh, not only Europe and Asia, but also the African continent which had a continuity across the Suez uh, because the Suez canal is actually a man-made canal. So, from the uh, South African spaces up to the 
northern uh, uh, Eurasian spaces, we find a one single geographical contiguity and this Europe, Asian and African space was designated as a single island. Now, apart from this single great island, there were uh, uh, on the periphery other smaller islands and he defined that North America, South America, Australasia and the peripheral Southeast Asia largely uh, indicating the Philippines, Indonesia and, and other uh, maritime states as the peripheral islands from which the, the relationship would emanate towards this great island. And he says that owing to this same setting of the relationship, there is a great parallel in the history which is uh, of the recent kind so far as America is concerned and the longer history of England which it had in terms of being an island country and its relation to the European mainland. So, same relation the America would like to command or the, or the fate of the America's relationship would be of similar kind the, if it the, so far as the island of North America is concerned in relationship to the great island the, as postulated by the Halford Mackinder. This the map which he gave and he defined that the central uh, world island just as I defined and the North and South America towards this western part and the Malay largely defining the, the Malay Peninsula and the Australia, Australia towards its eastern side. So, this the whole global organizing of the space and this great island and its, its relationship in terms of network and communicability as railways and later on he also factored in the, the possibility of airways and air transport communicating and bringing this whole space as a single whole. He finds that this, these vast spaces can be easily commanded in terms of economic and military strength and they can be unified to command as a single great pivotal state. And obviously within that pivotal state the centrality of the heartland remained of prime importance. If you look into the present scenario or the kind of a uh, the postulates that Mackinder made through his 1919 revision. He brought this importance of this Eastern European corridor of, of, to a prime level. He found that this vast European, Eastern European space which is lying between Germany on the west and to the Russia on the east, this, this has been one of the what you call the fault zone or the great uh, tremor zone from where the reverberations to the whole world island went. It was only that the Russians at times pushed against the German monopoly that the, the Germans were actually forced to push back towards French and the British islands and who in the later course of the period of history were actually forced to look towards the world island. So, he says that this, this Eastern European uh, space becomes quite significant uh, and in, in the 20th century uh, it was also the scene of the two world wars that the contest of the space uh, has become important. Within the small scale, it may be a contest between Russia and, and Germany, but on the world scale, the, sim, the same organizational space can be seen in terms of America and the Eurasia, Eurasian space being seen as, as important. Now, he also, also brings in, brings in the another second fault line uh, as visualized in this map between the Western and the Eastern Europe. So, the West Europe is largely uh, uh, aligning with the what you call the outer crescent which uh, Mackinder had mentioned his, uh, his 1904 paper and this West Europe is essentially a maritime Europe which has, which has to align itself with the uh, Americas or the Australias in order to balance this European state. So, these two uh, broad fault lines that have the Mackinder actually uh, postulated as a result of the uh, 1919 revision. These, these are very important revisions in a sense that if you look into the current political scenario and what is happening in Ukraine and the way the conflict is uh, raising in, in this Eastern European corridor, uh, Mackinder was very right when in 1919 he actually uh, said that who rules East Europe commands the heartland and who rules the heartland commands the world island and who rules the world island commands the world. So, this axiom of 1919 which he uh, put uh, forth still holds certain degree of va value if you look into the what, you, what is happening in the current situation so far as the uh, tussle between the Russia and the NATO is concerned or the tussle between the, 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 the European states and the Russian influence is concerned or even for that matter the way the Russia has actually using the uh, oil and energy resources in order to strategically leverage the Eastern European corridor. So, we find that the, the Mackinder's observations hold a great significance in, in the even 
after 100 years of, or you can say near about 100 years of that revision that has come forth. And one of the important uh, qualifiers that Mackinder makes and though it has not been noticed by the scholars of the time was that a, he was very particular about ident identifying the ethnicities and the ethno-national uh, qualifiers so far as the behavior of the states is concerned. And he says that let us never forget we all know that the murder of the Austrian German Archduke in Slav Bosnia was the pretext and that the Austrian German ultimatum to Slav Serbia was the method of forcing the world war. He is indicating to what happened in the first world war. And we find that this is a very important indicator of what, what usually the geographers and the geopolitical or political geographers have uh, uh, left out the hyphenated notion of ethno geopolitics. And Mackinder was, you can say, he pioneered this uh, visualization of space and the state space in terms of ethnicities and the nations and how in the global order this whole scheme is figuring out. And through the Eastern European example, he brought out the notion of ethno geopolitics, uh, which only in the later stages, perhaps in the post Cold War scenario, as a re resurrection of the conflicts, uh, one is able to notice. So, he uh, gave, gave the uh, kind of a balance which the Germans and the Slavs are having in the same fashion of analogy the way the Romans and the Greeks had, the kind of the Roman Catholic Church, the influence which I have already discussed on the Poles, Czechs, Slavs and the Croatia and the Magyars of Hungary which was there and also the way the Greeks and the Greek Church had on the Russians, somewhere religion and the religion. Uh, you can say the, the, the way the empires and, and, the, and, the, and the religious polity has also somewhere embroiled into the ethno geopolitical uh, fabric which uh, Mackinder had postulated at the times. And it is not surprising that the way the in, international order, the way the conflicts have surfaced so far, though religion may not be in, in the forefront of so far as the communities are concerned, but yes, those variables and their directions, the way they have moved certainly speak of the old relic traces of the religio polity of the times that have emerged and similar in the similar fashion what is happening in the Middle East, we find that the, there is a the kind of struggle between the Israel and the Arab world it is not simply a secular struggle, but it has lot to do with the way on the periphery where religion and its extremities are being discussed and their discourse are being contested. So, the another fact is that the, the, the way the on, on the uh, eve of this uh, World War, or you can say the in the aftermath of the World War, the Franco-Russian alliance that emerged and France essentially lying with the maritime power and how it actually joined hands with the pivotal power to balance the German German ambitions. In a similar fashion, there may be a situation where the one of the possibilities where on the on this on the global scale, Russia and this world, uh, uh, the, the European space may come to certain understanding in order to balance any kind of ambition. And here, uh, I would like to uh, uh, bring to your notice that the during the Cold War days, uh, Russia was quite or USSR was quite uh, outreaching towards Latin American countries and the African countries and the way the Soviet help and assistance was provided, it certainly uh, gives one a sense of analogy to what Mackinder had actually visualized that how the pivotal state may actually rope in certain states on the outer periphery, uh, the, just the way the, the outer crescent space uh, would like to visualize the scenario of roping in the inner crescent st uh, states. And that also brings, brings us one or two, the classical modeling of this uh, state in, in one sense. So, uh, after that 1919 revision, we find that in the, uh, uh, we can say the dawn of the Second World War, we had the rise of Nazism in Germany and this uh, uh, vast uh, notion of geopolitics suddenly got into the vortex of what you call the geopolitical aggrandizement of the state and the state as a kind of a living organism seeking more territories and geopolitics went into the negative connotation with the scholars like Karl Hoshoffer, who at though did not specifically speak of in terms of the scholar, uh, scholarship or so far as geopolitics is concerned, but the term which he used was the real politics and he wanted to make the German nation see the point in Mackinder's scheme of the global organization of the space that how the centrality of the Russia, the way it, it has been exploited, the way, the way it has been projected 
In a similar fashion, Germany had also something to do in terms of centrality in Europe is concerned and also the, the way the maritime spaces are being visualized. So, he wanted to, to make the German race or German nation see a point in Mackinder's scheme of things and that is why he wrote this popular article, uh, Why Geopolitics and in which he says that for our future foreign policy, we therefore need geopolitics and we need the same thorough training of this discipline as developed by England. So, the, the importance, it, the only idea to, to show you is that how this Mackinder's model actually gained importance though for the negative reasons uh, the, the, the show the permanency of the model over the period of time. So, we look into the now the post cold war geopolitics and we find that the uh, post cold war uh, set of interest and also the frozen conflicts which have resurfaced in Eastern Europe have almost uh, given up the new sense to the idea and understanding of geopolitics and how it has certain degree of what you call the borrowings from the Mackinder model. The rise of new cities and the global city network which has been visualized and the contribution of different communities in shaping the nation state, we find that the, the notion of uh, ethno-national identities and the way the global cities seen as a juxtaposition to these state identities somewhere bring in certain kind of a conflict and the friction over the identity of the nations and their relationship among the global order. We find that this raison d'etre of net network and this foreign policy modeling becomes very important while defining these states and their interest and largely you, you will see that the conflicts have emerged into the states who are on the periphery inner periphery just as one the postulated by Mackinder in the is, is pivotal model. So, uh, the another proposition that comes up and that also uh, brings it certain understanding towards the uh, Mackinder model is the concept of geoeconomics which also is of prime importance that the centrality and the pivotal state retain its importance, but as a response to that state the vast migrations which have taken place from the uh, uh, on the periphery of this Eurasian space towards the outer crescent especially towards the North America just in the same fashion from the mainland Europe the population migrated towards England. The same model is again important in terms of defining the pattern of migration and towards looking towards this organization of the spaces in terms of migration spaces as well. Then the notion of territorial and the groups how the, the, the territories have been defined, the, the idea of definition in terms of uh, the, the new emerging nations in, 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 in post-colonial world and how the factors of religion and culture have become important as a conflict and on the periphery of these newly emerged, uh, emerging nations, the, the unstable borders and, and the contest of the spaces on the periphery has emerged. So, we find that all these are some of the important scenarios where one can see that the ideas and the concerns which were uh, given by Mackinder somewhere have their reverberations even in the post cold war uh, say uh, in the 21st century as well. So, the ethno geopolitics is one of the what you can say the final outcome of the discourse which Mackinder postulated and in fact the, the, the modern day ethno geopolitics not only shapes the internal structures of the nations and in fact all the, the modern nations, but also the outer global order is also one of the uh, facets where ethno geopolitics works and, he, and one of the uh, important citations here is that the United States continues to accept large number of permanent immigrants and without too much exaggeration it could be stated that immigration process is the single most important determinant of the American foreign policy. What I wish to state here is that the, 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 the impact of peoples and their choices of destinations have somewhere again revealed the fact that this great pivotal theory has certain uh, implications towards the both spa state spaces and the societies and their choices of movement. And the, the why this pivotal state could not be one of the important destinations of migration so far as the uh, Eurasian space is concerned reveals exactly the why the, the, the very reasons why there was a need to look into the what you call the singular organization of the space along the oceanic and the maritime powers and how the geographical features have developed into the what you call the spatial attributes of the political organization of the world and how the communities have uh, responded to that. And it is it is one of the uh, that is why the famous uh, scholars uh, the Nathan Glazer and the Daniel Patrick Moynihan when they try to define the term ethnicity and the, the notion of ethno geopolitics 
they said that despite the strong uh, resurgence of the ethnic conflicts, there has not been the tendency to shift the borders and the state remaining more uh, uh, embedded to their territorial orders reveal the fixity of the nature of the geographical fa forces largely governed in the subterranean manner so far as the, the way the Halford Mackander has de depicted and defined. So, we see that uh, despite many criticisms, despite many uh, uh, ups and downs and, and Mackander theory going into the obliv oblivion, we find that there is a great relevance to the Mackander theory and one can see that over, over that period of time successive innovations and the remodeling of the space emerging not only as an imperial discourse, but also further as you can say the as a systems approach to the to the viewing the world as a single unified whole. Thank you very much. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for explaining us in detail the entire topic that um, Sir uh, Harford, uh, Mekander's Legacy to Geopolitics. And I would like to tell you all that if you have uh, any queries, you can mail us at um, info.cec at the rate nick.in. So that uh, the next time uh, uh, Dr. Ambrish comes, uh, we would love to solve your queries, which you would send through the email. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for delivering such a nice lecture.